there will be much moth in this clip, so be warned. It may not be strictly necessary for the next set of clips. I'm doing this more to wrap up the thoughts in the previous clips and to introduce some concepts that are useful in practical statistics. I should perhaps use more time on these concepts, uh, but that would make for a lot of algebraic videos. Keep your finger on the pause button and if for some bizarre reason you don't think algebraic clips are fun, it's quite alright to skip this one. The concept I'm going to talk about is called variance. In the previous clip I studied the binomial distribution which describes the probability of getting a number of successes in n trials, when each outcome is assumed independent from the next. I focused on the characteristic width of the distribution in order to argue that we can get strong evidence in favor of one model in comparison to another, where the models only differ in the value of the parameter p called the theoretical rate. If there is little overlap between two model probability distributions, then getting evidence for one model when the other has produced the data is small and whether you have any important overlap or not can be described graphically with the width of the distributions. Now it's time to make these concepts more accurate and to check if the width decreases with increasing data size. Intuitively, if it does, then we can get more reliable evidence for the model that has produced the data. First, a little generalization. The number of successes in n trials can be described as a sum of single trials, where you count the number of successes in each trial. Of course, the number of successes in each trial will either be 0 or 1. Similarly, the observed rate can be described as the average number of successes in each trial, as it is the sum of each outcome divided by the number of outcomes. What I'm going to talk about here is the statistical properties of averages of independent trials in general, but with these properties in mind the results can be used for the binomial distribution. Now, in order to talk about a characteristic width, we first need to find the center of the distribution to measure that width from. And for that we can use expectancy, the sum of the outcomes, weighted with the probability of the outcomes or the balancing point, if you will. Now, expectancy has the nice property that it's linear. What this means is that if you've got two uncertain qualities, x and y, then the expectancy of x plus y is the expectancy of x plus the expectancy of y. And the expectancy of a constant times x is that constant times the expectancy of x. Nice qualities when studying sums. And here's a nice exercise. If the expectancy of a single outcome is mu, then the expectancy of a sum of n repeated trials will be n times mu. And the expectancy of an average will be the expectancy of a sum divided by n, which is simply the expectancy of a single outcome mu. Let's apply this to the binomial case. By the definition, we have a probability p for success and 1 minus p for failure. So the expectancy will be p, as seen here. That means that the expected number of successes will be n times p, and that the expected observed rate will be p, the theoretical rate. Ah, but uh, how does the results vary around that value? We could construct a measure of this by looking at the expected deviance, where deviance means the absolute difference between the actual result and the expectancy. But absolute values are kind of tricky mathematically. Much better to define the deviance by the quadratic difference between the outcome and the expectancy. But then we are in danger of comparing apples and oranges, for if the outcome is in meters, the quadratic difference will be in square meters so we need to take the square root. What we get then is the so-called standard deviation, the square root of the expected quadratic difference between outcome and expectancy. Now, the thing underneath the square root sign, called the variance, has some nice mathematical qualities. 
Since we've defined variance using expectancy, we inherit good stuff from that definition. The squaring does create some problems though. If we've got two unknown quantities, x and y, the expected variance of x plus y will be the variance of x plus the variance of y plus a cross term called covariance. Covariance describes the linear dependency between x and y, so you can readily guess that with no dependency you'll get no covariance, though not vice versa. But naming something doesn't prove much, so here's a proof that independence means no covariance. I'm not going to go through the algebra here. If you want to study it, freeze the frame or check out the PDF. But it's just definitions and heavy arithmetics. What this means is that if you are looking at the sum of n repeated independent trials of something, the variance of the sum is n times the variance of a single outcome, which I've called sigma squared. But that means that the standard deviation only increases with the square root of n. If we look at the variance of an average, we can use the linearity of expectancy to find that the variance of the average goes as the variance of a single trial divided by the number of trials. That's the result for a sum divided by n squared, as variance involves a square of the input involved. If you want to study it, freeze the frame. So the more trials, the less the variance of the average. The errors cancel each other out in the long run, as they say. The standard deviation of an average is thus the standard deviation of a single trial divided by the square root of the number of trials. If you want twice as much precision in the resulting average, you need four times as many measurements. Let's see what this means for the binomial distribution. The variance of a single outcome is p times 1 minus p squared plus 1 minus p times p squared, which is p times 1 minus p. So the variance in the number of successes is n times p times 1 minus p, and the variance of the absurd rate will be p times 1 minus p divided by n. The standard deviation is the square root of that. Here's a set of examples for p equals to 1 quarter and n equal to 10, n equal to 100, and n equal to 1000. Ok, now we've got a nice definition of characteristic width, but can we use it for something? Can we say that the probability of getting something outside the expectancy, plus minus the standard deviation, is so and so much, or at least put an up limit on it? What if we look two standard deviations to each side? Is getting an outcome outside that interval unlikely? It turns out that you can show this. I'm going to use a result called Chebyshev's inequality. What it says is that the probability of being more than t standard deviations from the expectancy is less than 1 over t squared. I've outlined the proof here for those interested, pulled directly from Wikipedia. The proof uses the so-called indicator function, which returns 1 if the expression inside is true and 0 if not. The neat thing with that function is that it can transform a probability into an expectancy and that you can replace the expression inside with an equivalent expression. The rest is an inequality you can check for yourself and some cleanup afterwards. For the binomial case, this inequality means that getting an absurd rate more than two standard deviations away from the theoretical rate p is less than one quarter, and getting more than three standard deviations away has less probability than one ninth. Ah, but the standard deviation of an average decreases with increasing number of repeated trials. So the probability of getting a result outside a fixed range around an expectancy will decrease. If we do this for the binomial case, I can set t equal to a constant u divided by the standard deviation and get an upper limit of the probability of getting a result outside a fixed range u. It is proportional to 1 over n. So when n goes to infinity, that probability goes towards 0. 
That's a result much celebrated in frequentistic statistics where asymptotic results are deemed important. There are more asymptotics that can be shown for the case of averages, but I'm not going to cover that now. In the Bayesian case I would much rather focus on the finite case, which says that I can get an absurd rate in an area around the theoretical rate P with a given reliability by doing enough repeated measurements. Or the more data the merrier. Guess this was a long haul in order to show something that simple, but the message about four times the number of data to get twice the precision should hopefully make this exercise worth the while.